Amanda. It's really an honor to be here. And thank you to everyone who is in attendance today. So my name is Rich Dixon, former classroom teacher, curriculum coordinator, ed tech director, and administrator. I've been in the ed tech industry for quite a number of years now, and I've seen a number of new technologies come in, maybe decline a little bit, and then mature and really become something that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm really excited to be able to be here today. I'm currently the uh, leading the creative services team, that's curriculum, as well as instructional design at Clarity Innovations, which partners with a number of ed tech companies to make their pedagogy and their solutions more effective for teachers and students. That's so great. Thank you so much, Rich, for being here. Dan, who is the man <laughs> that is helping us, um, that's got to be the first time I say Dan, that's the man probably in our work together. Do you mind turning on chat because you're the host? And thank you, Laurie and Amy, for uh, letting us know that the chat is disabled. That does mean we still want you all to, when it is uh, able, enabled to do that introduction like Alice has done. Um, okay, so I'm Amanda. As I said, I'm a former uh, teacher. I taught high school biology in the Bronx. Um, I have pretty much done every job in education. Um, and now starting, I just started AI for Education about two months ago when I realized how disruptive AI will be for schools and educators around the world. Um, my last role, I was in Australia running an education technology company there. I am not Australian, um, but it was a great opportunity to see the world and see education um, across many different contexts. So we're just really excited to have this conversation. Um, we already have 112 people here. We're hoping to have more um, and just really appreciate your time. And so our agenda is we just had our introduction. We have an activation activity very, very soon. And then we're going to do a little bit of a two-prong approach. So we talked about reimagining teaching. So the first is what's happening now? How is teaching changed right now, whether you realize it or not? Like what has happened? So we're going to do a deep dive with Rich on thinking through how to use um, AI. We're gonna use ChatGPT because we like to use uh, free resources um, to get started. And then we're gonna do, we have three key questions that we're gonna be looking about when we think about the future. When we really think about what teaching can become and what learning will become. We're gonna end right at 45 after the hour, but if you'd like to stay on, we will have an extended Q&A. Um, so just know that like every, anything you put in the Q&A, we're gonna try to answer. Um, but we don't want to keep anyone. We know how important your time is. Um, so we'll keep you here to the 45, but if you want to stay with us, that would be great. So um, we have two things. Uh, Dan is going to launch a, a short poll so that we can see who's in the room. And this time I can, we can actually answer. So I'm going to answer right now. Um, oh, no, I can't answer again. <laughs> It's, uh, but everyone else should. And then what I want you all to think about is if you had a magic wand, which, you know, who doesn't want a magic wand, especially as busy educators? What is the one thing you wish that would make your practice easier? So what, what if you had that magic wand, what would you do? What would you take away? What would you add? What would you do? And if everyone can think about that, and then if you have an answer, uh, I know we're asking you to type in the chat a lot, but if you could put that answer into the chat, that would be great. Um, I'm going to start with you, Rich. Like, what 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 is your magic wand? If you could have anything in the world, what would it be? For me, I think it would be trying to address the age old problem within ed tech of how do we better differentiate and personalize learning to make it more meaningful for students and get to deeper learning outcomes. Yeah, um, I started AI Forget Education because I hated making rubrics. <laughs> you know, I after uh, creating 200 courses in 20 months. Uh, and having to do three rubrics per course and format them. The ability for AI to do that in, in 30 seconds is why I started. So I'll say rubrics. I never want nice. to do a rubric again. But let's see who's got. So thank you so much. Okay, so Charlotte, I'd poof, I would poof some parental and community support. Um, Jen's like, take away grading, writing, please. Heard. Um, we've got... Um, uh, oh, that's so great. Someone from Brisbane. It's so good to see you. Good morning. Reduce the time spent creating content from Christy. Um, we've got um, time to plan and implement the ideas I have. Amazing. More time to plan the lessons the way I want them to be. Um, and grading. We've got an LOL from Lindsay. That's definitely a plus one. Uh, Susan would love to learn how the students learn to the difference between cheating and the use of a tool. Very interesting. We'll definitely talk a little bit about that later. 
Michael saying, uh, give teachers time back to ensure explicit teaching occurs. Very interesting. Krista, creative choices for students to think critically about today's issues. We do have a lot of issues right now that we should be talking about. There's so many get here. Collaboration, a personal assistant. Um, no one said they want them to be able to do your laundry. <laughs> you know, I think that there's, you know, these are all really, really good, but I'm sure there are other things we love as, you know, again, we're all busy um, trying to um, work within the context of education, trying to make it better for kids. So I'm gonna come off sharing. And so thank you so much. Um, and it's so good to see this and please, you know, look and, and chat with everybody. But when we think about the magic wand, we talk about reimagining teaching, we're starting to have that magic wand. That magic wand is generative AI. And when we talk about generative AI, we mean that a human-like artificial intelligence that has been trained on billions of or trillions of pieces of data and is able to respond to you as if it is a human, which means that no one, you would think about coding, for example, which we, we want to teach a lot of our students. It's always been about learning syntax and, you know, different commands. But now what you can do is enter, build me a website with a sentence and literally a website, a whole front end will be built for you or a picture from Figma, which is a tool. And so what's happened is we have translated this idea of having to learn how to communicate with technology through how technology communicates and to being able to use our human-like language, typos and all, to be able to get outputs that are supercharged and super powered. So when we think about that magic wand, we'll talk about this later, we don't believe that it actually is a magic wand right now, but it is an opportunity to start rethinking what teaching is. And so we're gonna, I'm gonna move to you, Rich. And so when you think about that magic wand and where it is today, what is the first thing, like the now of it, what is the first thing you think of in terms of how we can reimagine what teaching is? Well, I love it because I think it fits right into what many of you were mentioning in the chat, and that is the administrative or clerical or busy work. The tasks such as planning, going out, synthesizing large complex ideas, especially if you need a refresher in a content area before teaching it, things along those lines that really free up the time so that we can focus on what I think for many of us is our love for the teaching and obviously for students as well. So we can be more focused on that and buy ourselves some margin. So I think that would be my quick take. Yeah, and absolutely. I mean, we, I don't think any of us really got into teaching or helping teachers through ed tech or nonprofit, or if you're another type of professional or even a student here, I don't think that we get into the profession because it's glamorous. It's not well paid, unfortunately. It's not even considered a profession in some situations, like in terms of the same way that a doctor or lawyer is, even though the one, you know, outside of healthcare, the thing that impacts every single person in this world is education and educators. Um, but at the same time, we do it because of passion, because we do it because it's important. We do it because we you know, there's an opportunity to make things better for kids or, you know, and I think that, or or if you're in adult education, other adults. And so I think that this is where it can be really interesting to see how can we start to strip down all of those, you know, there's 10 to 12 hours a, a week that most teachers are spending outside of the classroom or it, and how can we strip that down into two hours, three hours? And what can, what kind of what kind of place could you get back to? What kind of love or time or effort could you get back to if you weren't grading papers, you know, worried about an email you have to send if you're going to have the right tone or whatever those pieces are that are maybe keeping you back from being able to focus on that that magic in the classroom, which you guys are the magic wand, really. The educators are the magic wand. So let's get started, though. So like, let's actually get in there together. So Rich is going to share his screen and he's going to take you through um, a couple of live examples. Um, so. Do you want to kick us off? Yeah, you bet. I'm first going to draw your attention to the AIforeducation.io website. And within this website, under teacher resources, is a prompt library. And I think we ought to play in the prompts. What do you think, Amanda? Let's do it. Yeah. I spent some time on this last night. If you've seen it between yesterday and today, it's got a new look and feel. So if you have any feedback for me, let me know. Excellent. Well, I'm going to start with lesson plans. And Amanda, do you want to give a little overview of your vision for this prompt library? Because I think it's so powerful and really caught my attention the first time you described it to me. 
Yeah. So, I mean, I think that right now, because this is the worst AI is ever going to be, right? Um, yes. And so, Dan, do you mind sharing the link? But this is the worst AI is ever going to be. And it requires a lot of thought, right? Like, there's something called hallucinations, which means that AI is telling you what it thinks you want it to hear. There are things like prompts being very, like, if, if we all entered the same prompt right now in ChatGPT, it would be our outputs would all be different because it's been designed to have differences. But what we wanted to do is we wanted to build a really easy way to get started. So these are kind of the key lesson planning, activation activities, personalization, even student exemplars, rubrics. So all you have to do is cut and paste. You cut and paste, there's brackets here, and you can change them. We also have an example, because sometimes it's hard to understand like what this could be used for. So for this example, Rich so beautifully has a very simple lesson planning prompt, and then we have an example. So we're actually going to start with the pretty robust one. And then at the end, the best, the great thing is get creative. Like this is just a starting place. This is for you to get creative, to build your capacity, but also to make sure it works for you and your practice. So why don't we get started, Rich, with uh, building a pretty robust lesson plan in I don't know, a couple minutes? Yeah, that sounds great. So we have an example here, as Amanda mentioned. I'm going to go to chat.openai.com. Again, a free resource. And our goal, again, is to be able to focus on free resources for you today. Please notice that there's one area of learning needs. And so I'm specifically going to be adding in, uh, let's say, a hypothetical student or students who have auditory processing difficulties. I'm going to leave it really broad intentionally just to start with. So let's go. So right and now, you, oh, go I'm ahead. Sorry please. to interrupt. Um, so if you haven't gotten started, like this is a good opportunity to. Um, also, I found last time, Rich, if you go to the top, you can actually, you can just stay at the top. There we go. So that, because it's going to, if you notice now, if you've been using ChatGPT 3.5, which we suggest starting with instead of spending any money, is that the speed to the output has actually really increased, but it does make it funny on a screen during a webinar because it goes pretty fast. Yeah, and just to give you a quick overview, one of the things that you probably saw in this prompt is that I had dropped in a specific standard grade level subject. I've also asked it to do some things. Give me some inspiration around a hook. How do I get students engaged with this particular topic? And then I also wanted to bring in some, a video to help students create a sense of a vision for how this mathematical concept plays out in reality and why it's important. And then I also want to tease out some key vocabularies. Maybe I need to scaffold and front load that for students the day before or minutes before the particular lesson. And so it was able to go back through and build this. But like a lot of the output at this point, as Amanda alluded to earlier, the output here is going to need a little bit of TLC and a little bit of rounding. But what I love is it gives us a head start. It gives us something to go from, to edit, and improve upon. So I've asked it to give me a lesson outline. I may choose to do my instruction and structure it slightly differently. That's okay, we can change that. But Amanda, I wanna call you in to the conversation at this point as well. What's drawing your attention as we go through this? Yeah, well, I think what's really interesting is that, you know, I know that um, explicit instruction is really popular in Australia, but you might be at a school in which, like, if we go back up, that you really focus on, you know, deep diving into project-based learning, which we'll talk about a bit, or just, like, inquiry, or you want hands-on, or you have a specific manipulative. So what I would say is, like, maybe we can change this up so that we actually change the lesson so it doesn't have a direct instruction component. Do you okay. want to see what that's what what will happen there? And let's try using natural language because I think it's great. So, how about this? So remove the direct instruction. If I can spell, it's, I must say it's always fun to live type. Everyone, this is like the moment where your typing is the worst. But again, ChatGPT can still read it when you get pretty close. So the, changing the direct instruction to what did you ask it for, Rich? to remove the direct instruction. Let's see what happens. Yeah, so there's a couple ways, like, you know, it could, old school would probably just remove it, but let's see if it actually reframes the whole lesson in the amount of time. It looks like it does. So we've it got does. introduction, yeah. yeah, awesome. And I wanna point out something else, Amanda, that's really important. If you take a look at the auditory processing difficulties here, this is fairly generic feedback. And that's a function both of the age and stage of where the AI is. And I would also say, use your own professional judgment. Amanda talked earlier about hallucinations. Sometimes 
chat GPT is going to create an output that is going to require you to challenge it, uh, change it in real time practice and bring your own, own expertise. So Amanda, do you want to talk a little bit about that critical component of using a critical eye with the output as well? Yeah. So, okay. The, the way I think about chat GPT is like a lot of times we think of a tool as I enter, like a calculator is going to give me two plus two always equals four. Um, and ChatGPT is not a calculator. In fact, I love, like, if you're here from the ChatGPT for Teachers uh, group, shout out to you. I don't know who's here, but you're doing great things. Um, and so, um, just a second. Lauren, if it's giving you an error message, it might be overloaded. So what I suggest is you just reload the page, and then it'll probably work. So, you know, it's still a free tool. If it gets hammered in terms of usage, it can error out. But don't worry about having to upgrade. This has all been done with 3.5. But getting back to this idea of like um, word count as an example, if you want it to give you a word count, it's not going to be able to do it because it's not actually counting things. What it's doing is predicting the, not the next keystroke, the next word, the next section of what you want it to say. And it's you, predicting that by, you know, the entire internet up to 2021. But it does mean it gets things wrong, but it's going to get things wrong and you're going to believe it. So I'm going to give an example I had last night as I was building out prompts. I tried to do one with like mnemonic devices because that's pretty cool. I have trouble remembering things. And so I tried to get to make me mnemonic devices. And I said, you're an expert in this. And I said, please rate your output. And it was pretty hysterical. I did it five times and it managed to give me the wrong output, but really confidently. It even when it's, it was wrong the first time, it says it gave itself an eight out of 10. And then I had said, well, it doesn't seem like the, the words are actually the first letter. Try again. And it then went to a nine out of 10. <laughs> so it was even more confident and it was even more wrong. So this is why when we talk about doing this work is that you have to have a critical eye and you all have your own expertise, but it's just a good idea to check your work to, you know, to, if it doesn't seem to be working, like maybe avoid that piece. Um, and so it's just a really interesting way to start thinking of it as a thought partner, the same way that Rich and I, Rich might not have all the answers, I might not have all the answers, but I can get him to much closer to the answer than if he was on his own. And so think of it like that, but like instead of one Rich or one Amanda, you have uh, like 500 in one chatbot. Yeah, I think that's really great, Amanda. And something else I just want to point out in here, I don't know if you noticed the nuance when I described providing some scaffolds for the student with auditory processing difficulties. Notice that I did not include any personally identifiable information. So in other words, if a student um, has a specific targeted goal related to an IEP, feel free to drop that in. GPT will take care of that. But I would strongly recommend not dropping in personally identifiable information, such as student names, of course, addresses, or anything along those lines, just because student data privacy laws still apply when we're using any online tools. So just be careful with that. Amanda, anything you want to add to so, that? A thousand hundred million percent. Uh, you know, we believe in ethical adoption of AI. And so if you even want to show everybody, if you haven't done this and you're thinking even a moment of uh, like using any kind of PII or personally identifiable information, do you mind just going down to that, that, um, I think it's going to be like where the the little three dots are, but you should be able to actually change the set. If you go to settings, um, go to data controls, you can turn it off here. Oh, you're going to lose everything though. Like, so that's one thing to consider that you want to export your data, which is Rich is doing. If you, if you, you don't have to do this live because like, I know you're not using PII, but if you do that, then it means that it won't, it'll remember the chat. Because one of the things that's really cool about ChatGPT is that in the same chat, you can train it, it remembers. Um, it's actually one of the big differences between ChatGPT 3.5 and 4, which is the amount it can remember and ingest. But at the same time, it's not training, it's not remembering. And if you just want to be super duper extra careful, especially your students, I suggest using that tool to turn it off. Such a, such a good point. You can see a couple other things that I've been planning out over here. And those have been the same thing, Amanda, where I come back, work on a project later, and it generates that. I think one other thing to talk about, too, is that there are other tools that are being developed but are for profit, as Amanda mentioned earlier, to specifically address, say, building up an IEP or creating lesson plans. There's a number of those that are out there, and we could list them all. But I think at this point, again, we want to focus just on a free tool at this at this time. Some of those paid services, if you go out there and search for them, 
we're happy to, um, you know, maybe take a few questions on those that we might know, put us on the spot, perhaps a little bit, Amanda, uh, toward the end, but uh, offer some sort of freemium model. But again, we're focused just on a free tool today, but know that there are other services that are being developed for profit or a fee that are specifically targeted to take on specific tasks related to planning, for example, and other elements that are clerical work, really, for those of us that are teachers. Awesome. Amanda, any okay. thoughts on that, too? No, yeah, I, I have a strong, so so Rich is actually pretty funny. So Rich is like a super user, early adopter. Um, and so um, just really quickly, Rasha, we will share this link in recording tomorrow. Thank, if it's really late, thank you so much for coming. Um, yes. But we will share this with you tomorrow. But back to like the super user, I have a very strong philosophy right now that um, Gar Gary just said to, to us about this idea of like, it's a buddy instead of a thought partner because it can be pretty wrong. I feel very strongly that the reliability of these AI tools that are specifically using a chat GPT interface um, are not reliable enough to pay for as, and adopt at a at a district or school or a higher ed pl place right now. Even even um, plagiarism checkers right now that have been designed, they're not reliable enough and they can actually be harmful. So it doesn't mean we won't get there. We'll talk about this when we get to the, the next section, but it does mean that we kind of really focus on building the the your your kind of muscle memory and adoption here first before we move on to that. So, okay, who here loves project-based learning? I know Rich does. And so what we're <laughs> going to do is we're going to shift to the second um, uh, one of our pieces. Um, and so, uh, <laughs> Dan, it's really late. Thank you for joining. But yeah, PBL, we love it. But I'm going to ask, so we have an example here, but let's make this interactive. So can I ask the audience um, to give us a couple of key, actually, uh, uh, Rich, do you want to ask a couple of key areas? And what we'll do is we'll update this based on, let's let's crowdsource it Mad Lib style. So we need cool. what we need. Absolutely love it. So let's start with a grade level and or one or more subject areas. I love PBL, big background in that for me. Um, was at the Buck Institute for a bit of time there working on this particular uh, teaching methodology and absolutely love anything related to it. So feel free to throw in multiple subjects because I always love to bring that into PBL. So let's start with that. Amanda, okay, so, you want to okay, just so feed me some yeah. Things. Okay, so we've got a couple of maths. So why don't we do math? But we also have a math and history. Who doesn't love multidisciplinary oh, okay. PBL? Let's do that. Um, oh, I want to create a unit link in chemistry and medieval history. Denise, I you and Rich should meet after. I'm sure <laughs> you'd love to see the output, but maybe do that one because that is hyper specific and sounds really cool. cool. I want to be in your class, Denise. Um, and then what grade? Like, what grade is your Denise? What grade is your? Um, uh, oh gosh, in middle school science, these are so good. These are all ones you should be trying at home. So year eight in Australia, we're in Australia. Oh, you know, I was in Melbourne, so I love our Aussies. It's a morning there, but um, so let's do eighth grade and then it's middle school science. I'm oh, sorry, it's his chemistry and medieval history. Um, and then the driving question. So yeah, so we're not gonna have the standard. So maybe what we do is ask it for the standard, do you think? I love that. In fact, we don't even need that because I can't spell. And <laughs> the thing is, though, it'd be fine. It's actually one of the things I love that I've been hearing over and over again is that ChatGPT has lowered the barrier for dyslexic um, adults and students to feel comfortable and confident in, in formal and written communication because you can write it, you know, you don't have to get your spelling right. And what it does is it helps you reframe your writing. And so you don't have to get it right. It's going to be able, medical history, it's medieval history though. That one would probably be wrong. <laughs> I think it, uh, I, like I think it probably did that. Of, um, uh, let's create a, a quick one. Yeah. So a driving question. And while we're doing that, I'll just say, so Peter answered, um, Anna about, um, the data and graphs. Um, and so, yes, the, definitely you can do referencing the doc, but also what I would say is you can just cut and paste in data, like a data narrative. Um, graphs, there are a couple of different opportunities that are different tools, but the, the easiest thing for the free version is going to be to upload it, like not upload it, but cut and paste it in and then have it work off that in the same chat window. It's okay. I know we spelled medieval wrong. We'll see if it... <laughs> oh, sorry, friends. 
Good thing we're not we're not like giving you the big bucks for spelling, Rich, but it's just your no, wonderful prompt engineering this. skills. Take a look. Oh at goodness. This. Oh great. Oh man. How long would it take you to build this on your own? You know, I will be honest in planning so many different project-based uh, plans. I think one of the biggest challenges is starting with a blank slate and just simply taking a look at standards. And so being able to have a frame like this to take and look and use and copy and put into uh, say a Word doc or a Google doc or something like that and use as a project plan, at least an initial one is just huge because um, again, not starting for, uh, with a blank slate. Notice by the way, um, that there's not a whole lot on here. It's a dear parent letter and it kind of ran out of some space there. So do you want to talk a little bit about word limits as well, Amanda? Yes, exactly. So the chat GPT, as we talked about before, it has a, a limit of both what it can remember and what it can output at one time. And so, and so in this case, a really cool new part of this at the beginning, it would make you regenerate the whole response or continue, but now we can set that little button where it says continue generating and it's going to finish this prompt, which is a really great, like this is an example of OpenAI, which is the company that has built uh, ChatGPT of taking feedback and being able to do this and improving their user experience. But there we go. Um, so, um, okay, let's go up. Let's see. And like. So at one level, Amanda, this is pretty lightweight. We don't have a ton of information behind the milestones, but at least I have a really clear understanding with all the expected different elements of the milestone. So like a project launch, which is you know basically a unit hook, if you will, and then really important concepts, and it's kind of spaced them out. So I might go in here and add activities and resources to match, but this is a really good start. This isn't like an off the shelf, just adopt it and put it into play as is, but it's a good start. Yeah, so I have a good question from from Gary, um, who says that the Buck Institute's gold standard is really rigorous. So, yes. you know, if you're working by yourself, it's, a, you know, it can be a really huge barrier to adoption. But how do you how do you know if this is actually using the Buck Institute's methodology? Like, what, well, you're you go, an expert on this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Having worked there and still uh, really cheer along the work of all my friends that are still there. It's pplworks.org is the name of the website. And if you're not familiar with their two rubrics, one is the rubric for what is a project. And that will outline the rigor or gold standard project design that uh, was listed there within the um, aspirations, let's put it that way, of this prompt. And then the second one is the teaching practices that are required to facilitate high quality project-based learning. Um, and so those are the two that those organizations publish. It's open for you to go in, take a look at, there's some free training materials on there as well. This wouldn't meet those requirements through and through, but it's a great start. It follows the general outline. So specifically, one thing that is missing from this particular project summary is more details around project activities that include student-led feedback and then refining those ideas and going into an iterative improvement of the project itself. And then I think it's decent, but I would love to see a little bit more specificity in this one around the public presentation of learning and giving that a little bit more meat. It would be great, Amanda, fan of rubrics, to be I able am. to ask it to develop some ideas for rubrics so that the audience of that public presentation had a focused uh, viewpoint on that presentation and a way to give some feedback at the end. So those are just some kind of quick takeaways, but if you're really looking for that rigor, yeah, you're going to need to add and beef that up for at this particular time. But I can well imagine that there these tools are going to not only evolve, but that different teaching methodologies like Gold Standard PBL will have um, the resources needed to put together an AI bot that will generate something that's a little bit more rigorous than this and won't have you adding as much as you would need to to this particular plan. Okay, so I'm going to, so there's two things also we could do. One is what we can do is we can also just upload the rubric that you talked about, uh, yeah. Rich, and have it grade itself on this and then have it regenerate based on the feedback. Love that. So, so that's it, because I don't, not all of us have a Rich in your pocket. And so he was very easy to get into that. So what I think is, like you could always take a secondary piece and have it reframe and redo. But the second thing is like, let's actually act but refine on one of those pieces. Let's deep dive even, let's go even closer. Let's do, let's have well, it build out. Yeah, yeah, one of those pieces. Okay, so.
So how might the audience at the of, at the public presentation of learning provide feedback using a rubric? Okay. Okay. Cool. Here we go. Let's see what Again, it comes it's up thinking. with. It's trying. <laughs> yeah, we can we can scroll down now. I think that is probably good enough for us to see. There we go. Okay. And this is the. <laughs> oh, it's interesting. You want to talk this about is formatting. One of those yeah, this is great. There, okay. Maybe not the formatting, right? So let's talk yeah, about that. Yeah, it, it needs a little bit of help right now. So what I would say is it's probably being a bit overloaded, and so the outputs aren't great. But this is another great example of let's ask it to do it together again as a as a rubric and a and a format and a chart, and let's let's have it do that. Oops. And this happens like this happens all, like kind of it'll it'll suddenly give you a list, and you're like, but I don't want a list. I want to like. Put it in a, a chart and then it'll get there. Oh, and yep. So interesting. So we're we're having some issues here. It's into a table, maybe. Interesting. There we go. At least it's closer. Yeah. Yeah. So what I would say is I think this is a really good example of um, where it doesn't quite work like you want it to. And it's the, it's the first time I've ever seen in that actually format as a chart. Um, and so that's really, really fascinating. So this is an, this is an example of uh, where like you have to kind of like, it's not gonna be immediate. And it's actually the best thing we can show you. Uh, yeah, we can get even more specific. Let's try Let's try even more specific. Format this rubric as a table with separate cells. Um, for each, you know, section. But yeah, so Doris says it happens sometimes. And this is the idea of, of temperature. Um, and oh, Lori, thank you so much for following along. It worked for you. Okay, so this is the thing. Good. Like, it's, this is a great example, though, of like, you know, it would take me much longer to do this. And it can be a little bit frustrating. And if you're using this with students and our teachers, and it kind of fails in this manner, sometimes what can end up happening is you can have some, this is hysterical. This is like, it's going to give yeah. us every version of a table that is wrong. I love this so much as an example of like when it doesn't work. And so what I would most likely say is that this is an opportunity for um, probably like taking what we have, refining the other pieces, and then we can get even more specific. But I'm going to guess that what's happening is this is more of an issue of um, <laughs> this is more of an issue of uh, like computing ability and like the way that it's like remembering and its actual memory. So what I would most likely do if this is me. I would continue to refine, make sure it was that, and then I would have it, then I would cut and paste this into a new chat window, and then I would ask it to format a rubric for this. And so it is busy. It is like key time. It's 6.30 in the evening here in, in the U.S. But I, we want you to, this is why we do this, though, is that when we talk about reliability, so let's actually come off screen. Let's have this, get move into the then and now. Generative AI will never, ever, ever be as bad as it is today. And we just showed you an example of like what that means in real life. It doesn't mean that we didn't get to a PBL Buck Institute 80% in like five minutes, but it, and which is amazing. And that's that could take hours or even like longer than that because you have to actually go and think and process and find and find the time and your, your own cognitive load to be able to do that. But it is at a space where it's not going to be as reliable. And so what we wanna think about now uh, and it's at Ali's point, sometimes it'll continue to be wrong um, and that will happen, but it is improving at a rate that is hard for us to understand. So let's, the last couple minutes, what we're going to focus on is the future. And so, you know, in this case, so we just saw like the possibility of it and some ways in which you can speed up and lesson plan and, you know, use uh, different types of tools to, like our prompt library to get started. Um, and then, but like, what's going to happen? So if my first question is a question that's on everybody's mind is like, you know, isn't like, what's going to happen to assessment? What's going to happen to traditional assessment? When we already have a lot of fear around cheating, especially around traditional assessments that are essays or other types of take-home tests or writing focused uh, assessments. So what's the future of teaching going to look like with, you know, an AI that can write an essay better than I can most days? Yeah. I mean, I love that question. I think I'm going to take inspiration from a friend of mine who was giving an assignment this spring and he actually required students to use chat GPT. And what he did is he required students to share their ori the original output 
and then with and paste that into a Google Doc and then make their updates to make it more accurate, to polish it using their voice, and then to be able to contextualize it to their locale because the writing prompt was something about their particular community that just wasn't being addressed by the output. And I think within that, what it was teaching students how to do was to think critically. In other words, when they're consuming content online, just assume that there may not always be accurate information that's coming back. So thinking critically. And where I'm going here is it's more important than ever to teach success skills. You can call them the four C's, uh, transferable skills, the critical thinking, using their own creativity to take an idea and actually make it even better and scowl off of what's been given to it. So I think that's just a, a fast response that I would have there is that I would say embrace instead of running away from uh, the AI and all that's what's happening there, find ways to help embed those transferable skills and those deeper learning outcomes for students when they're engaging with the output of these tools. That's really interesting. And I, and I think that when I think about the like reimagining teaching, we think about traditional assessments. Um, they haven't worked for a lot of kids or adults. I will say I was in the PhD program. Sorry, grandma, never finished. She's still mad at me. But one of the reasons why I didn't finish is that I really struggled with academic writing. Uh, funny story, did publish four papers in Australia, so somehow, but I had a lot of help. I had editors and writers, but it actually is, a, like, even though I was really good at school, like, really good at school, and I was a teacher, and I, you know, I, I, all these things is that I really, really struggled taking philosophy and making it my own, and it stopped me from success, and I'm, I'm someone that's very privileged. I have been privileged in my, my upbringing, my, you know, ability, and uh, my support. But just imagine our our students that have not had that, and you know, to, and we've focused so much of the traditional assessment on these skills like writing and essays and recall, and and not on you know really kind of thinking about critical thinking or creativity um, or collaboration or communication, which are really the soft skills that are going to be the future even more. And so I think that this is an opportunity to move from this idea of you know, kids completing assessment to what is your evidence of learning? What is your proof of effort? How did you try? How did you think? I would say that like, if you're having, if you're a higher ed or you're a K-12 teacher or you're an ed tech or nonprofit, I would really be thinking about how are you gonna integrate generative AI? Like show me how, like we just did, it was so funny. It failed multiple times, but show us how it failed and how you got around it. And maybe it didn't get around it and I had to do it by hand. And that's a great learning, but that's thing that's really where we have to go with this. I absolutely agree. And a little bit of a sidestep, Amanda, but I think it goes back and I want to touch upon the assessment bit. I know that it can be really challenging to work uh, formative assessment in the assessment for learning. In other words, how we're mm -hmm. going to take and respond and contextualize and differentiate learning. And I think one of the great ways to use any uh, AI tool that's for the purposes that we talked about today is to ask it to create formative assessment based off of learning objectives, uh, standards, any other student learning outcomes that you are interested in and to build in the different differentiations that are needed to meet the needs of your students and your context by asking and refining in the ways that we demonstrated just a few minutes ago. Yeah, and I think this is this kind of goes to our, our second question that we're not going to have a ton of time. But, you know, one of the things that I think about a lot is that, you know, the idea of having a partner or an agent or a co-pilot it's something that's actually existed for a really long time. If you had enough money, you could get a tutor that would help you in all of your different pieces. You could have your parents sat down with you and spent time. You were able to afford this kind of work. And what's happened is that's a, and it's really shown that one to one tutoring, that one to one support has really shown like amazing benefits in terms of how students succeed, not only in school, in higher ed, and, and getting in career. That this is a really like when I think about reimagining teaching, I think about personalization. I think about, you know, Rich has his own co pilot that knows everything about Rich and he cannot spell medieval, and that's okay. We're going to get there, but he's really good at PBL planning and, and thinking through. And to be able to do that for every kid and every teacher and to help really deeply understand the best ways to have scaffolding, the zone of proximal development is something that is real, like all of that stuff, that, that's the place that I get most excited. Like the, the promise of ed tech has always been every kid can learn no matter what, right? We're gonna personalize learning and we've not gotten there at all. And I think that that's really the opportunity here. 
Yeah, and I think just to scaffold on it, things that we haven't touched upon deeply today, but I think we've kind of pointed to is being able to create content that is contextualized for your needs and those of the students. I mean, being able to do that, go out, scour, piece things together, stitch them together in a meaningful way that addresses standards and desired learning outcomes. You know, being able to create study tools for students, and obviously there's been a lot of talk about AI-powered tutors, and we really haven't dipped our toe today into that. That's just a whole nother area. Um, and then, of course, uh, a virtual TA, which is kind of more or less the kinds of things that we've been touching upon today is helping us with some of the, the clerical tasks. And I'm very hopeful, Amanda, coming full circle, that through the use of these tools, we'll be able to create more margin to focus on students and really start to reduce the amount of time of some of the clerical tasks. And I do predict that it's going to take a little while. It follows the other patterns of emerging technologies over the years. So what I've seen since the late 80s is that we're going to watch and see a quick adoption. There'll be some pain points along the way, as we saw today. There'll be a little bit of a trough of disillusionment, and then we're going to go right back up. and We're going to see a whole maturing of different solutions, but it'll probably happen at a much faster rate. It could be months, a few short years, rather than a span of multiple years like previous technologies. Agree completely. And it's going to, that speed that we can adopt it in our schools and our higher ed is going to be so important because industry is already adopting it. Well, we're coming up at the end of the 45 minutes, which is when we're going to transition into the Q&A. But before we go, a couple of things. If you can, um, Dan, if you don't mind sharing in the uh, chat the feedback, that would form, that would be great. We want to make this as good as possible. And so please give us your feedback. Um, like you said, this is one of a series of 10. We have the recording from last week was design thinking, but our next week is AI for educators, AI 101 for educators with the head of computing at Teach First. It will be at UK, US time. I think that's gonna be a bit hard for my Australian compatriots and my Southeast Asian, but we will have that recording. We'd love for you to join that. And then also if you wanna connect with us, uh, Rich and I love connection. So whether you're on the Facebook group or you are here with us today, like LinkedIn connect, uh, Rich is is on my right and I'm on the left, um, but you can do that with us. And if you can just please, please provide that feedback. If you have to leave right now, that's totally okay. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna shift into a Q&A where we actually answer through your questions. And so anything you wanna ask, I'm gonna pull a couple of the questions that we've already gotten. Um, and then we're gonna start to do those. But if you do have to leave, I just wanna say thank you so, so, so much. We appreciate your time. We know how absolutely important it is for you all to be here. Um, your time is valuable, especially if you're just ending up and finishing your year. We, we privilege your time and want to thank you. And I, before everyone leaves, please thank Rich, our, you know, wonderful panelists um, for all of his work as well. Um, you know, Tammy already said thank you, but um, that's really, really great. And those of you that can hang out, let's answer some questions. So I'm going to go to the Q&A. So Amy has a question. Is there a way to input or upload a pre-made rubric to ask ChatGPT to use to provide feedback? We did kind of mm -hmm. talk about this live. Um, yeah, it's uh, absolutely. Um, and it's a really, really good way to train that chat. When we say train is like actually have it like learn how to do it. So for the example of the Bucks Institute one, Upload that, ask it to, like, but I wouldn't stop there. Ask it for feedback and then have it reframe based on the feedback. And there's actually a really interesting one. You can kind of build that in of like, grade this as if you're three different types of people, an expert in the Bucks Institute, an expert educator or whatever, and then average all of those pieces of feedback. And then from there, refine it. And you can actually then have like something that's even more sophisticated because what you've done is you've asked it to do complex underworking with only one prompt, which is pretty cool. Okay, next question. Um, okay, uh, so can you input national curriculum outcomes and generate lessons and lesson plans? What do you think, Rich? Yes, absolutely you can. In fact, that's one of the things I absolutely love is if you have a challenging unit or lesson that you've just struggled with or you don't like to teach it just because it feels boring or students aren't engaged, I would recommend trying that challenge out um, within ChatGPT and drop your standards in. I think you'll get a chance to have, again, some inspiration that might change your thinking and ways about doing things. Absolutely. And, you know, it, it really is quite interesting. Like, it's, I will say that, you know, the, the way that it's trained is more, it's very trained by English language you know, um, the internet that's English language. So if you are working in Singapore or working in Korea, 
there's a there's a question that of like how well it will do that. But I would say for the US, the UK, Australia, it's you know, the IB standards, it's pretty reliable, which is pretty great. Um, and so um, next question is from Heather. I've been tasked with presenting at our history citywide for uh, all middle and high school teachers in ChatGPT and how it can be helpful. For an hour session, how would you outline it? Well, this is like, I'll let Rich go first, but Heather, you and I should talk. This is what we're doing right now for school. I'm actually going into uh, two schools uh, on Friday um, around this exactly here in Queens. But yeah, Rich, what do you think? What would you include? I think I'd probably start with the end in mind in terms of taking a look at the district or school strategic plan or graduate profile or profile of a graduate, something like that, some North Star that all of you have. And then I'd probably backward map to see what are the most challenging tasks or experiences learning wise to getting students to accomplish those and then start to backtrack and say, okay, from there, I always think about the planning for student instruction and the student experiences with three buckets. Number one, again, what is that student experience tied to those outcomes? I think number two, what are the learning experiences, the lessons, units, another teaching methodology like you know project-based learning just to continue that theme. And then what are the teaching practices and tools needed to be able to accomplish those? And so I might outline things along those lines. That's very high level, I understand, but not knowing more about the context, that's where I would start. Yeah, and I, I believe in um, first situating AI as something that's not new. So we did, a, if you were here, I know a couple of people are here. Thank you for coming again. But we did an AI on your pocket. Like if you take out your phone right now and it recognizes your face, even though like you have a hat on or every time I have one, unless except for one pair of sunglasses where it thinks I'm someone else, that is a form of artificial intelligence. Autocorrect is a form of artificial intelligence, like AI. So what we've done is we've had a step change in terms of what we call generative AI and that human-like ability to ask a question and get an output. So I always like to start there. And then I want people to start seeing the same way we did with you. We actually, what I would suggest, Heather, is the same way we, we did it, where we brought people along. And it was so great. I'm so glad that um, uh, Vina had never used it to create a lesson plan and did it today. That is exactly what we want to happen. Um, and so we'll just go that way, but then give people time to have their objections heard. And not in a whingy way, but like in a way of like, let's let's really talk about how we think this is gonna change our practice. What do we need to have in place? What kind of training can we do? And when you take it that way, then I think it really helps people bring along and they can see the value of it immediately. They can see the limitations and they can also feel heard, which I think is so important for any new technology. Um, but I have a really great alley, let's do it. So why don't we go to chat CBT and let's put a prompt in. I'm gonna make a professional learning prompt, uh, actually, maybe not tonight, but tomorrow. But let's put a prompt in, Rich. Let's do like, what would, let's put, um, create an hour long uh, lesson, or uh, so professional development for history, uh, middle and high school teachers. Do you wanna just share okay, your screen? give me just a second. You bet, yeah. absolutely. Let me share the screen. And while we're doing this is that we actually also have a lesson plan and curriculum that we're building. Well, you can go ahead, you can share. Uh, okay. that if you want to also share that as well, we can share it on the chat because that's also another example of getting your teachers wrapped to head around like how to actually do this with their students. But yeah, let's, let's ask GTP, ask chat GPT. Okay, now long professional development session on, what was the topic again, Amanda? It was for history um, teachers in middle and high school of how to use uh, chat GPT. And for those of you that want a recording, uh, yeah. Yeah, good. Sorry, I'm just going to answer. Uh, we have this recording with this one and for last week's and for all of them. So like we'll send that tomorrow. Although I will say apologies for those that I sent an email last week and I forgot the recording. That's well, why. Amanda, let's do this because I yeah. saw a yeah. question, I think, asking whether or not this can build a slide deck. Yeah, it's great. So let's, let's do it. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, let's, before we do that, though, let's just go up really quickly and see what it says. And so if it's close to what we were saying. So it's got an introduction. The benefits and challenges, okay. Yeah. Um, and then let's go down. Um, exploring use cases, so examining the various applications and history, which is great. Virtual historical figures and career based learning, creative writing, and then strategies for implementation, and then ethical considerations of also citizenships and QA. So this is a pretty good start. I would say, like, this is definitely a place you would refine, but that would be great. But now let's actually build a slide deck for this. So it'll, like, there we go. Let's see what it comes up with. 
maybe might be thinking to yourself, wait a second, I was looking for a real slide deck output, but this is going to be the text you're going to take. And again, as Amanda mentioned, you can copy and paste or at the top here, you'll see this little copy here and you can hit that symbol and just drag it right into a doc and then copy the text from there into a deck. So Amanda, any other yeah. commentary on this? Well, you could also ask it to, to provide, um, you can ask it to provide what kind of image you would want associated with it. Like, so right now, so Candy, um, ChatGPT, um, like in the in the free version, that's going to be hard. If you have the paid version, you can it'll pull in um, you can pull in like ideas for images, but it can at least give you an idea of what you could use if you use Canva. Curapod is an example of a tool that um, creates. Um, uh, here I did it, Rich. Uh, it, it creates uh, PowerPoints with AI. Canva does uh, as well minimally, but that would be what I would suggest. But let's come off and keep keep rolling. Ooh. Um, okay, so Kakenna and Lori have the same question, and actually Mikkel as well. How how do we start moving to students, and like how do we do this? So how can teachers utilize this in front of students? Uh, how can teachers and students collaborate to create an engaging teaching and learning environment? And then how can you model this? Okay, so the modeling will start there. Exactly what we just did. Do exactly what we just did. Yes. Fail. But first of all, do something cool and then fail. Yes. <laughs> like, we failed. But at the same time, like how much did you learn about how unreliable this is and how much you have to take a critical thinking hat? So I will start with that one. But yeah, so how can we have this be teachers and students working together? I love it. Partner. Go ahead, Rich. Okay, cool. I think one thing, again, in addition to that modeling is actually building in an assignment where you're having students be able to take their interests and apply it to that concept, whether it's mathematics, whether it's history, whether it's science and whatnot, be able to generate some information and to be able to slide, if you're familiar with edu protocols, uh, quick little aside for the work of John Crippo and Marlena Heppard. If you go in there and you take a slide deck and you have students go out, and do their little inquiry on a way to apply the knowledge or a just deeper dive into the topic and then add their summary and with their takeaways to a single slide within a class slide deck and then students have one minute to share their learning with the rest of the class, that might be one way to go. And then to ask them to think critically about obviously what they're gonna share before they do it. So that's just one way to start building the, if you will, the muscle memory and the practice of using this tool and then sharing back the learnings and then be able to compare and contrast how accurate those results were and have a discussion around the use of that particular tool with the whole class. Amanda? That's just on the fly. Yeah, so that was I like a poetry it. slam attempt right there. I, I love it. Well, there's two. I would say that if you look at our lesson, what we have is we do like a bit of table setting, but then the, the kids actually interview the chatbot about the chatbot. And yeah. so we use like a bingo card, but like what you're doing is a very meta thing, but you're actually asking the chatbot to give you back answers. And what they're going to see through that is temperature, meaning like there's a lot of variation in answers, even with the same types of questions, how to beginning think about prompt engineering, how to start, like how to spot a hallucination. Um, I, I kind of love the idea of having like the best hallucinations that you have is like every month, whoever has the best hallucination, you know, wins a prize or it's kind of a fun thing of, of doing that. Um, I also think that what's great is that um, we have some Juneteenth prompts that we did for Monday. Mm -hmm. They're all student focused. And so it's like, have a diary created from perspectives, news articles that are like written from the point of view, create a poem in the style of Langston Hughes around Juneteenth, like some really cool stuff. So we have some examples of how you could have students use like creative prompts also around key times that are pretty low risk in the sense of like, they're not going to be necessarily like build me a deep inquiry like based approach, but something to get started and get familiar with it and make things more interesting. Okay, I think this will be our last question. Oh gosh, okay. I'm Gemma <laughs> Carey. I'm doing several three hour sessions this summer. Any helps or info is appreciated. Good for you, Carrie. Um, yes. I, I think for me, like, you know, 90 minutes is probably a good, a good place to maybe split it into two, but Rich, do you have any ideas? I have a ton. I'm happy, Carrie, if you send me an email at aiforeducation.io, Amanda at aiforeducation.io. I'm happy to chat with you about what we've done and share some of it. But Rich, do you have any kind of takeaways or some, some good tips? Yeah, I think one thing to do might be a little bit of tour of the landscape as well, in addition to the tools that we looked at today. There's several different tools out there right now that, as I mentioned before, are freemium with the free part being uh, a really full feature set. 
Um, and so that might be something to explore as well. And maybe if you reach out to Amanda, Amanda, I'm happy to share a, a whole list yeah. of resources that I would copy and paste if I had them at my fingertips right now. I don't, but happy to pass those along that might be worth taking some of the teachers through as well. And again, those are specifically meant for either planning or for helping students actually learn in the moment. So that's the, those are some resources happy to provide as well. Yeah, and I think that for me, like it's hands on get us in. And but you can also I mean, you can dig into thinking about creating working group policies, the ethics. We have a case study I can share about thinking through how AI tools can be used, how you can support them, frame them. Um, someone in the chat had talked about using gamma to create uh, you know, a great PowerPoint, but then being able to cite it as AI generated. So normalizing the citation is going to be really important. But, you know, those are type of things that are really great. And so I just want to wrap up again. Dan, if you don't mind putting the um, feedback form in the chat again, because feedback is everything for us at this stage. Um, I just want to say thank you so much to Rich. Rich, thank you, sir. I am so privileged to have you as a thought partner in our own journey of learning about and, and trying to share best practices in AI for education. Just thank you so much for being here. Thanks for letting me be here. It's really an honor. I enjoy, as always, talking about this subject with you anytime. And just thank you for everyone being here. Um, you know, we're going to have this recorded. There are seven more of these. We'll probably do one every week until you guys stop coming. Share with your um, your team. Uh, we have, you know, we want you guys to be here. So just share and and be here with us and just keep up the good work. And we're just really excited to do this. And so have a great night or morning or afternoon or midnight and just really, really appreciate you guys. Thanks everybody.